Hello and welcome to Cosmology Corner, the show where I answer your questions about space, astronomy and astrophysics. As this is a new show, I think it's only appropriate that I start by answering the question from the guy who actually came up with a name for the show, and that is Archangel of Stories. And he said that he's heard about these wandering black holes, but he's wondering if these things could even exist, and if so, how? Now, before, I will just quickly need to explain what a wandering black hole is, because I'm not exactly sure if he means rogue black holes or wandering black holes. Rogue black holes are, are black holes just out in the middle of nowhere, not maybe not even in a galaxy, in between galaxies. Now, black holes are notoriously difficult to detect as they emit very, very little in terms of light. Often when we detect black holes, we detect their uh, effects on their surroundings. But if their surroundings is just empty space, then it is very difficult to detect them. It's possible, but very, very difficult. While these type of black holes in theory should exist, um, I don't believe that we have any um, concrete observations of them. I've been looking around and I haven't found any papers that, have, that directly have detected a black hole wandering or, or flying around out in between the void between galaxies. So they should exist, but I don't believe we have detected them just yet. Wandering black holes, on the other hand, is when you have a supermassive black hole at the end of a galaxy that is moving with relation to the rest of the galaxy. So it's it's not necessarily sitting right at the center, but it's it's wandering through the galaxy. And, and this motion is called peculiar motion, this velocity, peculiar motion. And the question is, how does this happen? How does a, a black hole all of a sudden begin to just wander away from the center of the galaxy? Obviously, these things are very, very heavy and it requires a tremendous amount of force to get these things to move anywhere. So I've been reading through a few papers and what I could find was that the theory is that these things happen when you have a galaxy merger. So you can imagine you have two galaxies that is going to collide and they're gonna merge into one galaxy. When that happens, the galaxy itself could have been disturbed enough and the close proximity to another um, supermassive black hole could have caused enough um, gravitational forces to accelerate um, the black hole up and, and after the merger has then been completed, before the galaxy settles in um, and, and, and falls to rest, you could have a situation where the, uh, the center black hole has that peculiar motion and is moving within its own galaxy until it, it, it kind of settles in. But again, Galaxy evolution is so slow, it's over billions of years. So that's the best theory I've been able to find is that wandering black holes are caused by galaxy mergers. We have a question from T. Parker and he asks, how are we able to tell the chemical composition and mass of something outside our own solar system with any real accuracy? So it's a good question. I mean, if, if we know nothing about stars, how, where would you even start? And the start point was actually binary stars, where we have two stars orbiting each other. And you could measure the light of one or the other star. And as they orbit around each other, when they move away from us, they, the light will be Doppler shifted to be more red. And when the star moved towards us, it will be Doppler shifted to be more blue. Similarly to when you have a, a, any like emergency vehicle driving by, by you with, with its sirens running, it, it's, it's higher frequency when it goes towards you and as it goes um, away from you, it is lower frequency. That's just the, the sound being Doppler shifted. The same thing happens with light as objects move either to mortars um, or away from us. So based on the orbit times uh, and the orbit speed of these objects, we can begin to determine um, the mass of each object by, by simple orbital mechanics. So if you do spectrogram of the stars and you know their mass, you can begin to do a um, a, a catalog where you can compare the mass of the stars to their um, to the spectrogram and more specifically their color and we'll begin to get that relation where we know that bigger heavier stars they emit more blue light because they are hotter so their black body radiation is um, is, is, is warmer um, like the, the color of a star is, is really just the same effect when you heat up a piece of metal you probably all seen it when if, if you um, put a piece of metal in a, in a furnace it will heat up and it'll begin to glow in, in a reddish color and it will probably even begin to go white at some point. And as it cools down, it becomes more and more red until you can't see it anymore. And that is just the black body radiation. That's just temperature emits light 
uh, at different wavelengths, depending on the temperature. And the same thing happens with stars. Stars at different temperatures emit different wavelengths of light. You know, based on the temperature or the light, uh, the wavelength of, of the star, we can then determine the, um, the size of it. But stars are built up of different layers, and, and one of the, what would often describe as the surface, is what's actually called the chromosphere. This is where well, light and color from the star comes from. But there are layers above, which is described as the star's atmosphere, even though it's not an atmosphere in the same sense as we have on planets. But these, um, as the light passes through those, the atmosphere of the star, some, um, some wavelengths is gonna be blocked dependent on the chemical composition of that gas. So based on that, we then know that different materials, they have different bands where they block light. And then based on that, we can then determine what materials um, must be in, uh, in the least the upper layers of the star. And an interesting thing here is we can also use that to detect the star's age, because in the very early universe, all we have was just helium and hydrogen. And the stars then begin to burn and form heavier and heavier materials. And they would then eject the outer layers, but that gas that was ejected would eventually collapse into a new star. But that star will have some of that burned material, some of those heavier elements present in the upper layers because there's no fusion reaction happen in the upper layers of the star. It's all happening at the cores. So the chemical composition of the outer layers of the star will remain the same throughout the star's life. And that means that we can, we can use that chemical composition of the upper layers of the star to determine when it was born. Because the more polluted or the higher metallicity the, the star has, um, the later in the uh, evolution of the universe the, um, the star was formed. Dan C asks, why do some stars appear to twinkle and others don't? I'm gonna need my notes for this one because there's a lot of numbers in this that I need to, uh, to remember. But first, we need to talk about angular size. You see, when you look up at an object in the night sky, they will have a size, and the way we, we measured it is the what angle does that object cover in the night sky? If a point there and a point on the other side of the object could be the moon, what angle does that make uh, when I look at it? Obviously, because we can't just say it's, it's this many kilometers or, or miles across, because it doesn't make sense, because well, the moon is looking a lot bigger in the night sky than Jupiter, but Jupiter is many, many times bigger than the moon, but it's so far away that it looks smaller. I think that's pretty intuitive to understand that we are talking about angular size here. Now, if you have, if you have a circle and you divide it into 360 um, degree segments, each of those segments is, can be divided into 60 smaller segments. Those are called arc minutes. Each arc minute can then further be subdivided into 60 even smaller segments, and those are called arc seconds. And those are the things we use when we determine sizes, because everything is so small uh, in, in astronomy that instead of talking about 0 0.000 whatever uh, degrees, we're talking arc minutes and arc seconds, because it just makes things a little bit easier to work with. Jupiter is about 30 to 50 um, arc seconds. But if we look at the star with the largest angular size, that is a star called R Doradus, and that is 0.05 to 0.06 arc seconds. So that means that the even the biggest star, not by size, but by angular size, is still about one hundredth of Jupiter. Now, that alone, of course, doesn't make it twinkle. But if you've ever watched a video that somebody um, recorded of the moon, for instance. This is where you will often see it. You will, uh, you will see that it kind of shimmers a little bit like if you look over a hot road in the summer, you will see this mirage effect. Same thing happens with our atmosphere all the time. And when you look at the moon, it's often where it's easiest to see. And these disturbances have a, like a specific like, uh, like pockets of air where it happens in. And the size of this pocket is so that when the light comes in from a star that is very small, have very small angular size, those pockets of air has a much bigger angular size from our point of view uh, than the star. And that means when the starlight passes through such a pocket, it can be deflected. And that's why some of the light will go through, some of the light will be deflected out as the atmosphere kind of shimmers around. And that is what's causing the, the star to twinkle. However, a planet, which as we talked about is much, much bigger uh, in its angular size, the, the, the column of light that we get from that planet uh, 
is bigger than the angular size of these pockets of air, meaning that even though some of the light may be deflected, a lot of it is going to make it around that disturbance. And that's why planets do not appear to twinkle. So if you look over the night sky and you see a, a bright star that doesn't twinkle, then it's not a star, it's a planet. But if you see something that twinkles, then you know it is a star from outside um, our solar system. Those were the questions I've decided to answer this time around. If you have any questions you think I should answer in a future episode of Cosmology Corner, then go ahead and post them in the description below. So you can imagine that you could kick the ball so hard that it would leave the Earth's atmosphere never to return. Now the velocity where that happens is called the escape velocity. For the Earth, that is around 11.2 kilometers per second or about 7 miles per second.